Hello, everybody. My name is Devashish. I'm here from Rutgers University, and I'm really happy to be part of this session. I want to thank the organizers for putting this together. Coral Omics is a growing area, and uh, I want to share with you some of the work we've done in, uh, in the past year on coral metabolomics. In this talk, I want to take on uh, a few topics. The first is to provide a perspective on how we look at symbiosis, the choice of model systems for the coral research, the broad goals of our research, the metabolomics data that we have generated, and the outcomes of this research, and finally, a final slide on how we're planning to build a coral stress monitoring device using metabolomics data. So we've worked for a long time on algae um, and uh, other models that are involved in complex biotic interactions in nature, and these interactions are with other organisms or with the environment, and um, some examples are shown here including on the left, studying how horizontal gene transfers shape uh, the evolution of major algal lineages, in this case, the sushi uh, wrap um, seaweed pyropia, as well as other um, um, algae that have adapted to extreme or other conditions. We've also studied how photosynthesis has emerged in a, um, uh, in a sacoglossin slug lineage called Alicia chlorotica. We've looked at how it, Green algae have shown up in interesting places in the world, for example, in isolated bison skeleton in Yellowstone National Park, shown in the middle. And on the right are two images of Polynella chromatophora, a photosynthetic amoeba that has become a model for understanding how a, a temporary symbiont, a cyanobacterium, ultimately becomes a photosynthetic organelle. And we're trying to understand how this complex uh, union of two different cells uh, is created, maintained, and inherited over time. What we've learned from our forays into different symbiotic systems, be the algae, lichens, sea slugs, protists, and so on, is that we can think of them as comprising two pieces. One is the entity in charge. In this case, uh, showing the Mustang car as, that's the chassis, that's the host cell of the host organism. The Mustang chassis has the controls for running its motor. Uh, it houses the motor. It has all of the parts that will allow the cell to function. But without the motor, which would be the symbiont in this case, it doesn't function very well at all. And this understanding of how a energetic organelle is housed within a host cell, the kinds of controls and outcomes of this uh, interaction has been one of the most important areas of research in my lab. So in the case I'll talk about today, and the coral holobiont, the coral animal is the chassis and algae and other microbes are the energy producing organelles or other components of the microbiome. Now these systems tend to work quite well under normal healthy conditions. It's under dysbiosis that they fall apart and by perturbing these systems we can actually gain the most insights into the controls over different aspects of the biology of the symbiosis. Given this background, so we were very excited to uh, enter the coral field and work in Hawaii is shown here. And most happily, we work with a bunch of fantastic scientists. Uh, many of them are shown here. They include one of the organizers to this session, Holly Putnam from Rhode Island with her student, Dennis. Mehdi Javenbard, an engineer who is working with us to develop a microfluidic device for the coral stress instrument. I'll talk about it at the end of my talk. People working uh, on the metabolomics uh, results I'll discuss today, including Xiaoyang Su, Amanda Williams, a PhD student in my lab, Eric Childs, and then some work on graph theory with metabolomic data, which was done by Janan and Pathmanathan, a postdoc in our lab. And of course, we worked a lot with Phil Cleves in trying to bring together omics and genetics methods to understand corals better. So the model system we are, I'm gonna talk about today and, and one that uh, my lab and our collaborators have focused on is the Hawaiian archipelago. It's interesting for a number of reasons, and I think it's important to keep the basic features of the system in mind. One of them, of course, is that the Hawaiian islands are formed by a volcanic hotspot, hotspot, excuse me, uh, that has over time deposited islands as the plates have moved over the hotspot. In this case, starting from the bottom right to the top left, you can see that the islands are older because they were deposited uh, from half a million to 7.2 million years ago. So this is an interesting way in which novel islands are being created. And of course, we have to try to understand how this particular uh, type of um, land origin impacts isolation um, and uh, 
and the movement of flora and fauna between islands and so on. Beyond this really interesting sort of formation story, we have the fact that the Hawaiian archipelago is the most isolated populated archipelago in the world, and therefore we can expect that introductions of species are probably going to be rare, and we can expect a lot of endemics. And in total, in combined with the way that the islands are formed, we should expect to find some differences within species that uh, live in these islands. Now, the one way to think about how this very particular bad geography may impact corals is under the drift barrier hypothesis that was put forth and popularized by Michael Lynch, which is a really powerful uh, neutral evolution model, which suggests that as population sites get smaller, um, selection is weakened, genetic drift increases, the mutation rate of the DNA increases with this under weakened selection. If we apply this sort of concept to corals and their genomes, we can postulate that uh, under isolated conditions, we would have the formation of endemics and weakened selection in these isolated populations would lead to the propagation of selfish genetic elements, such as transposons and, and the massive growth of gene families. Therefore, we can make a prediction and test the idea that there may be something called the Hawaii effect in which whereby uh, corals that are found there, they may be found in other parts of the world, but the local populations might in fact be uh, undergoing some of the outcomes of this drift barrier hypothesis. We've tested this idea with two coral genomes we have sequenced so far from Hawaii, and we have two more uh, genomes in the pipeline using long read technology. Um, what we find here is shown in this phylogeny of uh, um, robust and complex corals that the two species, Montipara and Parides, in fact, have about double the, the genome size of other corals that are more widely distributed. They also have about double the number of genes and gene families. And this suggests that there may be um, an impact of isolation on these coral genomes. And we, I point this out to you only because this would have a really, I think, interesting impact on how we interpret genome data, how we interpret a response selection, how we interpret the, the um, the biology of the coral given these very fundamental aspects of its origin and evolution. Okay, given that brief introduction, let me get uh, directly into the experiments I wanna to discuss uh, today. Um, they are, this is work that was done at the HIMB in 2019 uh, using thermal stress as a, as a way of understanding how corals respond uh, to changing conditions. This is of course one of the most important stressors that we know and expect corals to face in the coming years. And for this experiment, we use a tank system shown on the bottom uh, right of this picture and focus on two species, Montipara capitata and Pocillopra acuta. Montipara um, is a thermally robust species. It has the capacity to withstand times of bleaching, that is loss of algal symbionts through phagotrophy. So it's quite a robust species and builds a lot of reefs in, uh, in Hawaii. Pustla racuta, on the other hand, is uh, less frequent, but is also much more sensitive. That is, it relies very, very strongly on the algal symbionts for survival, and bleaching uh, causes great uh, problems for the survival of the species. Okay, so this was just a preliminary set of experiments. We actually have worked with Holly on a much longer set of experiments that we're uh, analyzing right now, but these preliminary data should allow us to, uh, should allow me to show you the kind of uh, information that we can gain from using metabolomics. So the thermal stress was from 2.7 to 3.2 degrees over ambient conditions, and we gained water from uh, Kaneohe Bay, uh, which was pumped into, uh, into the tank system to maintain the corals. So before we get into the metabolomics data, it should be pointed out that um, there's a lot of darkness associated with corals. That is, there are many, many novel uh, coral genes for which we have no functions, no annotations. On top of that, the, uh, the, the number of uh, known metabolites in marine systems is very, very small. Maybe about 2% of the spectra can be annotated. So when we look at metabolites from marine systems, uh, we can expect to find many, many unknown metabolites, many of which may play very important roles in the biology of these uh, organisms, but for which we have no known function and therefore no pathway to put them in. Therefore, it should be kept in mind that much of the knowledge that will come from untargeted metabolomics is going to be dark by definition. So our experiments involved doing untargeted metabolomics, um, looking at 
uh, polar metabolites under positive and negative ionization modes. And what we can show here, for example, in the case of the Montipero Capitata data on the left, is the comparison of the metabolites that are produced under the uh, ambient conditions and under the temperature stress show a lot of differences in terms of their accumulations and their composition. And we, get, we also have found a number of metabolites for which there are annotations. And one of the most interesting ones I'll talk about briefly are called monoporic acids. These are uh, interesting metabolites that were initially isolated from Montipra eggs and have strong antimicrobial, uh, anti-tumor properties, and therefore have been um, an area of interest for scientists. Analysis of monoporic acids in the field sample shown in the FS, as well as the uh, control and the heat treatment in T1, T3, and T5, show that these metabolites accumulate to high amounts in the coral holobiont and are not simply present in the eggs. We also find that monoporic acid D in particular is highly expressed throughout all of the experiments. These are interesting on uh, two levels. First of all, monoporic acid is known to be an antimicrobial. Therefore, this may play a role in the thermal stress response during dysbiosis, and as well for its capacity to suppress photosynthesis of the algal symbiont. This may also be an important function of monoporic acids under thermal stress. Beyond monoporic acids, the most interesting outcome of our metabolomics experiments was the finding that dipeptides are the dominant form of uh, thermal stress response in corals in both Montipera capitata and Postulopera acuta, as shown here. The significant accumulation differences are always for the dipeptides, which are shown in the filled orange circles. And in the case of uh, Montipera capitata, we see that most of the most significantly accumulating metabolites are in fact these dipeptide molecules. We characterized four dipeptides in more detail. The results of one of those analyses are shown here for the arginyl glutamine dipeptide for which we have determined the structure. This dipeptide is both present in field samples of both species shown in the purple filled circles, but accumulates as well over time in the um, under high temperature stress in both Postulopera and Montipera. We think that our RQ may be a response to oxygen stress resulting from redox imbalance and this could be a very important marker for coral stress response prior to bleaching. Shown here are the structures and the accumulation patterns for three other dipeptides that were found in our data. And each of these dipeptides shows a similar pattern to arginyl glutamine of accumulating over time under thermal stress, in this case from Montipra capitata. As I mentioned earlier, we have determined the structures of all four dipeptides and are in the process of analyzing this in more detail.
Many other known metabolites showed a pattern consistent with the response to thermal stress in the two coral species we studied. We don't have the time to go into detail into many of these, but two of high interest are shown here, methionine and methionine sulfoxide. The methionine sulfoxide is the oxidized version of methionine that occurs as a response to reactive oxygen species presence in organisms. We believe that epigenetics and these two markers of that process are important in the thermal stress response, and these are areas that have been looked at in more detail by us, and in particular by Holly Putnam, my collaborator. To get insights into whether the metabolites that interest us are of animal origin or come from the algal symbiont or the microbiome, we use the Aptasia model, which is the sister species to corals, to do metabolomics to understand the accumulation of different metabolites under symbiotic and aposymbiotic conditions. This species of jellyfish is very, very similar to corals in that it houses dinoflagellate symbionts but doesn't biomineralize. We found many of the dipeptides and other metabolites that are associated with cor the coral thermal stress response to also be present and to show a pattern of accumulation that suggests that they may play a role in the symbiotic condition. For example, the RQ dipeptide is, accumulates to a higher extent in the symbiotic condition in Aptasia, suggesting that its role may be connected with the presence of the algal symbiont. We have been using cold currents network analysis to understand the relationships of different metabolites within the coral systems. One of the subnetworks from this analysis is shown here, and it shows the relationship between carbohydrate metabolism and osmolites. The osmolites are likely created by the algal symbiont and include a number of well-known metabolites such as glutamate, sorbitol, glucose, and betaine. What's interesting here, and we're curious in looking at it in more detail is that two monoporic acids form the bridge between the accumulation of these stress osmolites and carbohydrate and metabolism shown on the left uh, of this image. These sorts of analyses are powerful and allow us a way to generate hypotheses about the role of key genes in the stress response in corals.
In my final slide, I want to show you one of the directions our research is going in collaboration with Mehdi Javanmart at Rutgers University. We're using the metabolite data and the identification of uh, known metabolites and the proteins in these pathways to create a portable device for measuring coral stress in the field. This device will have two arrays, one for the metabolites and one for proteins, and we hope to have a rapid extraction protocol for both of these um, inputs to be able to do this work uh, rapidly and to be able to make it available to people around the world. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions.